Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Remote Pastoral Care. Uh, I am joined today by uh, my good friend Travis. Say hi, Travis. Hello, everybody. Yeah, I think by now, I think we can skip the self introductions because y'all know who I am. You know who that guy is, and you know who he is. I've been here before. Yeah, we've been Not here. Not very often, but I've been here. Yeah. Well, so, man, how is life? Life is just hectic, hot, sweaty, and full of anxiety and stress and uncertainty. I mean, the COVID situation in Tokyo is skyrocketing. Oh, it's yeah. We've had them extend the state of emergency yet again. I don't know if that's actually going to do anything. The numbers have gone up. They're still pushing ahead with the Paralympics, even after the Olympics caused the numbers to rise. Oh. Uh, nobody seems to care. And everybody's coming back now from summer vacation, which means that the school numbers are probably going to spike as well. And so we're all just like holding our breath, sometimes literally. Yeah, and it's it's nuts how surprisingly little Japan is doing to control us. After doing, after doing so well in the first half, getting into the second half of the game here, and they're just dropping the ball. I mean, out well, here in Togo, it's not quite as bad. Now, for those of you who aren't following, we're in two different areas of Japan. Uh, it's not quite as bad, but like we're next door to Osaka, and it's still going up there a bit. Mm. I'm fortunate enough right now, I guess, that two out of my three kids are still in school. Uh, but when you're the one who's at home more often than not, two out of three, if it's not three out of three, it's all the same at that point. That sounds about right. <sighs> yeah. But I will yeah. say this. This has been a great time for motorcycle buying for me, which has been my big thing. Really? Oh, you yeah. I finally bought a motorcycle this week. Uh, really? So yeah, well, here in Japan, it takes like a couple of weeks from the process, all the paperwork and get everything polished up properly. So I'm not going to take delivery on it until beginning of next month. Uh, but yes, I did finally get around to buying my own motorcycle after a year of going through the training and taking the courses and finding all the different bikes and then realizing I didn't want to get too big of a bike after all, because then you have to pay for the yearly inspections, which are expensive. And the maintenance costs. And maintenance ain't so bad on a motorcycle, uh, particularly because it's a lot easier to do a lot of stuff yourself, you know? Mm. Yeah. So not, not like with a car where, you know, you need a couple of advanced degrees just to figure out how to open the hood half the time. Yeah. But, so, yeah, I have invested myself in a Suzuki ST250. Nice. Yeah. What color? uh surprise i was i was going into it expecting to get a black because every one of those i've seen here has been a cute little black bike but i walk into this shop and I'm sitting right next to the black bike that i knew they had there was this gorgeous deep almost brown red nice yeah could not pass up on it, it had a couple of slight modifications done to it already which were in line with what i want to do with the thing anyway it's like it was just put there for me well so, uh, sometimes yeah. somebody's looking out for you yeah well we all know who that is yep all right so my friend what do we want to talk about today well i've been noticing a trend and i'm sure you have as well which is and this is probably exacerbated by everybody's anxieties around covid and everything else um well we'll start with the uh the question and i'm thinking it's something you might have experience with is um, dealing with racism and anti-Asian sentiment in the US. Yeah. I mean, you like me, um, we are both married to Japanese women. Mm -hmm. uh, I have never been in the US for any extended period of time with my family, I suppose at this stage, but you have. Yeah. Um, and I keep reading things in the papers about basically hate crime against um, Asian American Pacific Islander groups. Mm -hmm. 
in the U.S. And I'm just thinking, how does this keep happening? Yeah, it's look, I'm going to I would be lying if I said that race is a simple subject to talk about ever. No, oh, no, of course not. I, <laughs> I got somewhat infamous during my time at seminary for taking interesting positions in our, our critical race theory course, um, which, by the way, um, for those of you who are thinking about critical race theory being taught in elementary school, my first encounter with it was in my second master's degree. So, you know, cool your heels. Um, but yeah, um, it is a complicated subject. And one of the most difficult things I've found about living through the race dynamic in America is that whether you're a hardcore racist or hardcore committed to um, you know, egalitarianism, on both ends of the spectrum, there seems to be a weird binary sort of mindset with respect to race. Um, I don't How know. So? You, well, um, you know, I, Explaining how race is a binary for racists, I don't think I have to do that. I, we, we all know. Uh, that either you're in or out, right? Yeah. Um, what I ran into uh, on the other side of things was, for the well-meaning folk on the other side, is racism was once explained to me as, you know, race is what you experience when you walk past a cop on the street. Okay. All right. Which in America is a fairer definition than most. Um, and I agree with in most respects. However, the counter argument that I have to that, and I wouldn't even call it a counter argument, I would call it more like an, an elaboration is that, or the problem with that particular analogy is that it assumes you're walking past the cop alone. Fair. And that's where we run into issues is because the very well-meaning people who discuss race uh, on our side. And again, for anyone who's listening who doesn't know, I am unashamedly, unabashedly liberal of my take to race. I believe in complete egalitarianism uh, as the goal and not as the current reality. Yep, um, same here, actually. Yeah, so, but I think we run into a degree of hindrance when we start talking about race as a solely individual experience. Um, as someone who grew up in a fairly racist section of the country, I and mean, you know you went to school there as well, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I am well acquainted with the term race traitor, uh, which gets leveled at you. And we left the United States um, before COVID had happened, uh, but not by much, but very much in the, the peak of Trump's uh, anti-Chinese sentiment, uh, which as we all know, carries over to every form of Asian. And, you know, yeah, I'm, I am not going to lie and pretend that I got it as bad as my wife did, uh, but I didn't not get it either. Uh, and so what that creates there is this interesting gray space for a lot of white folk uh, who are in inter interracial international marriages like us. Have you ever encountered that? I have encountered a little bit of um, not even from my marriage because again, I've never lived in the US with my wife, but mm -hmm. um, my brother is Korean. Okay. He was adopted when he was four months old. He was raised with me basically our entire childhoods. But I remember in elementary schools, kids being flat out stupid ass racists. Mm -hmm. And this was when he was like seven or eight. And we had to learn to deal with dumb racist white kids from Detroit in that sort of age bracket. Yeah. And thankfully, we've all been, you know, quite blessed with uh, when we did go back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. I mean, my wife wasn't exactly traveling alone at any stage in that when we did go back to visit. So I don't think she had any of it. And I don't think she was, I never really asked her about it, but I don't think she had to deal with much of it when she was a teacher mm -hmm. in a nice multicultural urban area in Minnesota. But and again, that was many moons ago. Yeah. 
what what I what I find interesting, like I said, that that kind of gray space you wind up in is we talk about bigotry and hatred and stuff like that, and I find <clears throat> that people who speak who uh, act as bigots and racists and homophobes and, and what have you aren't people as much like we we try to assume that these are people who have embraced their white privilege. I don't think many of them. But a lot of the ones I've encountered, the, the, the hardcore racists, the viral bigots, they're not people who have embraced the power of white privilege. Uh, I, I reserve that for your executives, your rich folks, your people who have coupled racial power with class power. Mm -hmm. um, your imperialists, if you will. Your, your imperialists, your colonialists, um, but not necessarily your garden variety bigots. The grand majority, the rank and file of your conservatives, your racists, your bigots, and yes, I'm sorry, in the American political scheme, I do absolutely rope them together. Um, majority of them are people who have come from these other spaces themselves, or spaces that they feel or experience as other. Um, so you have people who are white, for example, but also extremely poor. Mm -hmm. So these are people who have been told they have the white privilege, but have by other means been pushed into a space where they can't actualize it in the way they're told that people with white privilege should. And so why is it that they can't actualize it? Well, it must be because the others are holding them back. Yeah. I mean, the true, the true fact of it is it's intersectionality. It's the intersection between racism and class uh, mm -hmm. structures and things like that. That's what's really causing it here. But from the experiential side, you experience it as an assignation of identity and then an inability to enter into that identity. Okay. Which is basically like being told that you are guitar hero and then realizing that you don't have the coordination necessary to both pick and strum at the same time. It's like being told that you're guitar hero and then banned from every guitar center around. Like you have, you're, you may have the ability, but you have no way of knowing because you can't actually get your hands on the damn guitar. See. Yeah. So a lot of your racists, then they immediately look for something to blame. And because the entire thing was sold to them on racial grounds, there you have it. Now, this is interesting, but I'm wondering, because what I have heard a lot about, or been thinking a lot about on this recently, is going back even further to about the 1900s. Okay. Um, because, of course, history repeats itself. And I'm thinking of somebody that we all, being nerds, happen to know, a guy named H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, we, we, we are familiar with the man. Yep. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, for those of you in the audience who aren't nerds, um, is a well-known and well-regarded American science fiction slash horror writer who created, among other things, a sort of mythos about Cthulhu and the Great Old Ones being a bunch of beings from beyond the stars who will drive any who look upon them into sheer madness and this and that. And Typically, when we think of science fiction authors, we think of people like Don and myself who are super liberal in a lot of respects and who are just generally pro-egalitarian societies, um, people like Gene Roddenberry. Yeah. Uh, right? I, I was thinking. I was just thinking Don was about to say that, being the <laughs> that he is. Um, had to interject there. But Lovecraft was a complete bigot complete white supremacist and the reasons that i've read about for this say that it was because of fear because culturally what was going on at the time was the discovery of the pyramids and tombs in egypt and all of these quite literally in his case uh, old gods things like osiris and horus and set where it, like there was discovery of civilization and belief systems that were not necessarily, you know, Christianity. Mm -hmm. And these things started developing cultural cachet because of the archaeological and uh, just historical significance. And 
people started freaking out. Yeah. And so the response to that fear was Cthulhu and saying, you know what, none of this matters at all if these things do exist, because if we are wrong about Christianity, then there are elder gods coming to eat us that will drive us into madness that we cannot bear to look on. I want to hold that thought for just a minute. I want us to dig a little bit beyond the fear and go into the dissonance that precedes it. So you talk about um, his fear as it stems from the discovery of the old gods in Egypt and things like that, and mm -hmm. how that conflicts with his Christian understanding. And right there in that moment, you have a dissonance between his worldview as a, I'm going to say Christian, um, mm -hmm with all of the baggage that that entailed in his time period and mm -hmm. beliefs about Christian supremacy and what have you, you have that moment of dissonance between that identity and his identity as a denizen of a world that has other faiths, older faiths, things that have greater significance and solidity than he had previously ascribed to his own religion. Now that evolves into fear, but it began with that moment of identity dissonance. Right. Of and we see the same thing uh, in, in racist, biggest homophobes, what have you, people who are mostly nudged outside of their identity, not enough to get a broader perspective, but enough to have that moment of dissonance between their own identity and the world in which they can't access it, can't utilize it, can't perceive it in the way they used to. Um, and this is why and this is gonna sound weird coming from a pastor, I am always immediately a little bit suspicious when some, particularly when some Christian starts talking into a racial situation about kingdom citizenship. You ever heard that one? Oh, no, no, but it's raising a heck of a lot of red flags. Yeah, well, a lot, a lot of times when Christians talk yeah. about kingdom anything or A, genderizing God, which is just screwy, but B, also um, immediately ascribing a colonialism, a supremacy to Christianity. Um, and the, the, the mindset behind this idea is good. It's a belief that above our identity to nations and to races and to all these things, we are first and foremost citizens of God's heavenly kingdom and we must comport ourselves as Christians, yada, yada, yada. On the surface, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, in the same way that the phrase all lives matter is not inherently incorrect. Um, but when you apply to it and ascribe to it its context, what you're seeing it as is almost always presented as a reaction to that dissonance. I have lost X identity. I will grab this one instead. Now, the difficulty in that arrives, of course, because when you've lost your identity as a white person and you grab your identity as a Christian, you immediately ascribe all of those things you wanted out of your white people identity to that Christian identity. And that is that common thread that ties Lovecraft and his 1900s white supremacist Cthulhu uh, into what we're seeing now in the 21st century. Yeah. Is that sort of reality has been given a little bit of an earthquake table bump yeah. those people who do not recover their balance find themselves clinging to something with more strength and in trying to imbue that thing with more than it actually had yeah and you know we can look at it two ways we can roll, do as a lot of people do and roll our eyes at people like it's a worldview change to realize that other races exist and are equal come on dude um, oh, no. but you know, to do so discounts um, the experience of the individual. Uh, it discounts that these people are coming from isolated environments where to them that is a, a watershed moment, that realization that other, other people are people too. It's, wow. it's something that they haven't necessarily had to encounter before. I mean, if you're living in a town with a population of 300, yeah. And there's one family of black folks that live on the edge of town and everybody else is Irish Catholic. Mm -hmm. You know, 
you're going to have a certain view of things. And then when you start actually encountering them at the grocery store and talking to them or maybe interacting with their kids or their kids interact with your kids at school and one time you come over and it's the guest who's coming to dinner situation, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Suddenly on a personal level, everything becomes immediately more comprehensive. Well, there's another piece to that too. And this was the second thing I was going to say is that we discount sometimes the trauma that, and the, or the complex trauma that can come with some of the individual decisions that have to be made uh, in moments where these kind of self-contained, isolated environments break open into the real world. Uh, I'll, I'll use an example. As you mentioned earlier, we both have uh, Japanese uh, wives here. And I remember many, many years ago, and I, I've made no mistake about the fact that I have many members of my extended family who are obscenely racist. Um, and I remember the first time I brought uh, my now wife to a, a family event and I had a, a family member who I had been extremely close with uh, for all of my youth. Uh, we were Star Trek buddies, um, just best of friends. He was a, the, the absolute best uh, family member you could, you could ask for. And the first thing he does, he pulls me, pulls me aside with a knowing chuckle and asks about the orientation of certain downstairs bits. Um, and in that moment, this is the sort of decisions we discount. In that moment, I'm presented with a choice between that egalitarianism that I've always believed in, the righteousness of standing up for the equality and dignity of other people and a relationship that I had valued since I was old enough to remember. And me being me, of course, I shut him the hell down. Uh, and that was the end of that relationship. Um, but we, we don't, we don't credit, I think, the trauma that those decisions have for the people to make uh, in them. And that's not to say that as an excuse for making an unrighteous choice. But if you ask the question, why are people bigots? Why are people racist? What are the pieces that motivate them in that direction? Like, have you ever asked if you were willing to give up your entire family to a philosophical point? Like, there's a lot of people out there that'd be like, screw philosophy, that's my family. Um, that the abstract idea of other people that they may have only just met versus the people you've known forever, that calculus doesn't go the same way for a lot of people. I mean, it should, and you want to believe it would, but it doesn't. Yeah, reality doesn't always fall in line with theory. Yeah, and as, as those of us who, who have committed our lives to pursuing that egalitarian, egalitarianism and to if such a thing were possible to eradicate racism and things like that within our time, um, which of course, that ain't never gonna happen. Um, but many of us on the liberal side of the spectrum, we love to talk a good game about building an anti-racist society. And I don't know how many of these discussions you've gotten involved with, but when you talk about racists in that group, people who uh, are bigots, who are homophobes, who are rooted in hateful ideologies, it is very rare to hear someone approach that side with compassion, but also to approach, to even to approach it with understanding, to want to know why they do it. The, the almost universal cry I hear when looking at people who hold bigoted ideologies is, fuck them, we'll build our own world. Which is, you know, all very well and good right up until you realize that you need those people we're humans, we all need each other. Right, and, and you can't say, fuck them, we'll build our own society and still be grasping that same Christian identity as the rest of us, I'm sorry. Yeah. And you can't discard any significant portion of the human race, even if it's the one that doesn't, believe, doesn't agree with you. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the big thing, is the Christian experience is entirely about reconciliation. That is the end goal. The end goal isn't, and this is why I hate the evangelical influence on the modern Christian faith, the end goal isn't to make our way to the, to the heavenly trump at the literal rapture, which isn't a thing, um, and then laugh joyously as we go up and everyone else goes down. Like, that isn't the goal here. You know, it never was. The goal is to make peace with your brother or your sister, who you may have called a fool before going to the temple to ask your own forgiveness. And, you know, we, we talk about reconciliation. God, the, the Sunday school lesson of choice on reconciliation is always about minor scrapes you might have with, you know, a family member or a friend. It's never about figuring out how to work with and understand people who are inherently abhorrent to you. And that I think is the harder one. And it goes back to love thy neighbor, right? Yeah. And Jonah in the whale being sent to basically like his people's worst enemies mm -hmm. to preach them forgiveness. Yeah. And Jonah's like, hold up. I have no intention of doing this. I and God says, guys. well, okay, you're now in timeout until you change your mind. The parent in me loves that analogy, by the way. Am I wrong, though? You are not wrong. You are not wrong. I'm going to put you in timeout in the belly of this whale, and you're going to darn well sit there until you get vomited out into a better place. And there you go. Yeah. And that is, there's a piece of the Jonah story that I, I, I often consider as underrated. And it, it has to do more with the arc than any one particular verse. And, you know, we, when we talk about the Jonah story, we talk about Jonah didn't want to go. Jonah ran away. Then there was big, God said, let there be big fish. And thus there was big fish. Big fish eats Jonah and vomits him up to where he's supposed to be. The end. Mm -mm. Um, sometimes we'll get the tag ending. So Jonah went and did what God wanted him to do. The end. Um, but what we don't talk about is the fact that Jonah got there, spit out on the beach in Nineveh, and still didn't want to do the thing. Like he didn't have a magical change of heart when he was time out. He got spat out. He didn't want to do the thing. He did the thing because he clearly had to, as most kids do when they come out of town. Like, Fine, I'll do the thing. And then he realized, oh, yeah. maybe you had a point there. Yeah. And when then he spends the rest listened. of the the rest of the the book being so upset about the whole thing and how it worked out and how they got redeemed. Like he saved Nineveh and he didn't want to and he hated it to the point where he wanted to die. And God gives him a lecture, and then the story ends. There's no point where Jonah's like, I'm happy that I helped these people. It doesn't freaking happen. Yeah. And then, yeah. Like we talk, we talk about this, about how we need to, you know, heal racists, not kick them the hell out. But like, we don't have to be happy about it. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there's a point where we can't necessarily be happy about it until the end of that process and turning around and realizing it. We don't have to be happy during the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like, case in point, I build data centers for a living. Mm -hmm. I've been building this particular data center for just about two and a half years. And guess what? Hmm. It has not been a fun experience. Am I going to be happy to see it done? Darn right. Mm -hmm. Am I going to do it again? Probably. Will I visit this building with fondness in the future? Maybe. But do I still regret the fact that I spent the last two and a half years kicking myself half the mornings I woke up to go work on the damn thing? No, it's been a pain in the ass. Come on. Yeah. Like, and this is... You know, we talk about it in the context of raising, we talk about it in just about any context is, we talk about binaries, man. Like we, we want to believe that human beings feel only one thing at any given point in time. Like 
like in order to do good, you must feel good about it. Bullshit. <laughs> Sometimes you do good and hate every step of the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't tell you, like my whole theme for life is right thing first, fun thing second. Do I contradict myself? Very well. I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. I am also large, the Christian church, but multitudes. originally Walt Whitman. Yeah. Um, but that, that's, you know, the, the thing is we can, we can embrace people we find abhorrent because we have to, because reconciliation is the end goal, because trying to work towards that is what we're built to do. But we don't have to first get ourselves to a place where we're happy about it. And that is, you know, we talk about building reconciliation and stuff like that. And we're like, well, I got to get myself to a place where I'm at peace with doing this before I got to do it. The hell you do. You don't have to be at peace with doing the right thing before you do it. Um, and there is a lot more to unpack on, on this topic, uh, but we're pretty much at the end of part one here. So I think we're gonna we're gonna pause and cut here for a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna say uh, say goodbye to the folks watching and or listening uh, today, and we will kick the can down the road to to next week uh, for the second half of this discussion. You got anything you want to throw out there before we call it an end for part one? No, but I got a good question in mind for part two. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, you want to drop it now for a cliffhanger? Oh sure, why not? So the question is. Is Hitler in heaven? Oh, oh, there is a question. And I, oh, I, oh, no, it's going to be fun. Oh, I can't wait. All see right. you in part two. Hang folks. on to that one, guys. We'll see you in part two. For those of you who are still watching the end, thanks again for, for listening in with us. Uh, we'll catch you on the flip side in part two. In the meantime, uh, by this point in our release schedule, uh, you should be seeing all of our new different video series and fun stuff we're doing out there. And we should be, if everything's going to plan, rocking it pretty well. Obviously, I'm pre-recording this stuff, so I don't know it, but good money that that's what's going on. Uh, however, no matter what you may be watching for us, whether it's this video, Back to Basics, some of the other little stuff we're doing, Psalms from the Trails, whatever you're watching, uh, the real action's on the Discord server, uh, which is where our community meets and talks and sorts through stuff and plans and schemes and digitally kind of, you know, stirs the pot and yells at each other and reconciles to each other and yells at each other again as family and friends are want to do. And the great thing about this Discord server is A, it's free and B, you're welcome to join us. Uh, links to that are in the description or at the very least the link to our websites in the description and everything else is there. Uh, the Discord server's there, the YouTube channel's there, the Facebook channel's there. The uh, podcast stream is there, our blogs, um, the different feeds for tech stuff we're doing. Uh, there's a couple of surprises that are going to be there too. Uh, and for all I know, there may be even more there by the time this comes out. So check it out. All of the socials except for Snapchat. Uh, yes. Uh, and MySpace. Not, we have not got, is that still around? <laughs> Surprisingly enough, I think it is. Oh, man, I, I can't believe that. I, I was, you know, amazed to discover that live journal still exists or existed. It may have gone offline since. Live journal not only still exists, it was bought by the Russians. I know that, but I thought Russia might have taken it offline at some point. I think uh, it's still there. But anyway. That. Anyway, for the rest of y'all, we will see you next week. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm thinking about you. Pretty sure Travis is too. Yep. Uh, I'm praying for you, whatever you're going through, and God's with you too. Take care.